A little over a decade ago, a Chinese manufacturer of washing machines, refrigerators, received calls from farmers. And the farmers told them, your crappy washing machine is always breaking down. Why is the washing machine breaking down? Well, we're trying to wash our potatoes in it, and it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> so what would we usually do? We'd probably tell them, don't wash your potatoes in the washing machine. It's not made for that. Our plan is that you wash your clothes in this. They did the opposite. They said, you know what? That's unexpected that those farmers do that. But there's probably a lot of farmers in the world who have similar issues. So why don't we build in a dirt filter and make it a potato washing machine? And that's how the potato washing machine became one of their key products. Now, this is an example of serendipity, this notion of making surprising and valuable discoveries. Over the last 10 years, with my teams at the London School of Economics and New York University, we've studied how does serendipity emerge and how can we cultivate it as individuals and within organizations. And so I'd like to take you on a journey towards a science-based framework of serendipity. Now, as a starting point, you know, why is that important? Well, you know, we all tend to make plans, right? I'm German, I love making plans, right? Um, so we think we can map it all out and then real life happens and there's a little bit more about twists and turns and, you know, uh, somehow um, we have to make the best of the unexpected. So the question really becomes, how do we make the best of the unexpected and turn it into these beautiful serendipitous outcomes that a lot of times, you know, find you love, your co-founder, your next job, you name it. Now, as a first step, what we did was we looked at all the literature out there and we said, okay, if we look at the literature, especially in management and other areas, what is it that makes serendipity different from other concepts like blind luck and, and targeted innovation? And so the first aspect we found is, well, the key characteristic is there's some kind of agency, right? It's usually making discoveries. It's finding something positive. And so there's this aspect that it's very different from blind luck that just falls into our lap. We have to do something about it. Of course, there's also the second aspect, which is the surprise, right? There is some kind of unexpectedness, this kind of randomness that we can't see coming, um, but it's in the eye of the beholder, right? In the uh, words of Nassim Taleb, Thanksgiving is uh, surprising to the turkey, but not to the butcher, right? Um, and, uh, and third, there's the aspect of value. So there's either an abstract value, right? Something that, that feels like it might be positive one day, or there's a concrete value like the potato washing machine. Here's another example. Uh, any ideas what this might be? It's usually a very good sign if not. So a couple of decades ago, researchers gave people medication against uh, angina pectoris, the heart pain, and they realized that some of the male participants of the trial didn't want to give their medications back. Now, they were curious. They were like, why don't they do that? Well, it seemed to have improved their sex lives. Now, what would we usually do? We would probably say, oh my god, that's embarrassing. Let's not even talk about it. Let's just ignore that that happened. They did the opposite. They said, you know what, that's, that's unexpected that those men don't bring that back, but maybe there's something in there. A lot of men in the world might have a problem in that department. So why don't we develop a medication around this? And that's how Viagra, here under the uh, you know, name Sildenafil, became a best-selling product for erectile dysfunction, which in a way serendipitously emerged from those different trials. Now, what all these examples have in common, and hundreds and hundreds of examples that we've mapped over the last years is that it's not just an event. It's not just something that happens to us, but it's always the same process, where there's some kind of unexpected serendipity trigger, right? So it might be farmers calling up and saying, your crappy washing machine doesn't work. It might be male participants not giving back their medication, but then we have to do something with it. We have to connect the dots. We have to imbue meaning in that moment in order to then actually do something with it. But also, most importantly, we also have to have the tenacity to actually make it happen, right? It's not enough to just serendipitously bump into the potential love of your life in the coffee shop. You've got to go on dates, right? It's not enough to just have that idea, that unexpected idea of Viagra. You actually need to put it into a product, right? And so there's really this idea that a lot of times there might be an incubation time before actually something materializes, before it actually becomes something that has tangible value. The beautiful thing is, once we look at serendipity as a process of essentially spotting and connecting dots, we can influence it. We can learn how to spot triggers better. We can also create more serendipity triggers, and I'll talk about this in a second. We can learn how to connect the dots better, and we can also, of course, develop the grit and the tenacity to actually uh, pull through with it. Now, why is that important? In our research over the last decade with uh, senior executives, with people around the world who seem to be you know, successful in what they're doing, what popped up everywhere was that they're extremely good at cultivating serendipity. 
They're extremely good at somehow making serendipity happen more often than others, even though they are in exactly the same situations than that. And so um, Tom Linebarger, the CEO of Cummins, a uh, Fortune 500 company, beautifully said that cultivating serendipity is an active approach to leadership in times of uncertainty because there's only so much we can plan and the rest we have to cultivate the unexpected towards what feels right in that particular moment. And so the question became, well, what are these mechanisms, what are these traits, what are these skills, these qualities that can help us make more serendipity happen? And so there's of course the kind of detecting qualities, right? So there's all these qualities, curiosity, alertness, right? If we're curious why those people don't give back the medication, it makes it more likely that we find the reason for that. But also then of course we have to connect them to something meaningful. So we need some kind of sagacity, some kind of wisdom or, or creativity that allows us to do something with it. And then most importantly, we have to materialize it. We have to actually do something with all these potentialities, right? All these potential doors that are there, we got to go through a door and then open up new possibilities again. And so that's kind of coming a lot to social skill and other skills that help us to actually make it happen. Of course, a lot of times we might hold ourselves back from making it happen, right? We might sit in this meeting, have this unexpected idea, but then self-censor, not bring it up because we might not feel ready, we might not feel worthy, you name it. So there's all these barriers that we have where we can work on to actually overcome them. And in organizations and social groups, we can, we can enable that, right? We can create settings for psychological safety, we can invest into those unexpected emerging ideas, and so on. Now, what are some practices that we can use in our own lives to make more of this happen? Now, I'm a big fan of the hook strategy. And the hook strategy is essentially that idea that when you have a conversation with someone at an event like this, instead of just you know, saying, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, casting a couple of memorable talking points into the conversation that the other person can pick up and do something with. Someone who does that really well is Oli Barrett. Uh, he's an uh, entrepreneur in, in Great Britain. And so uh, if you would ask Oli this dreaded, what do you do question, right? That you kind of puts you into boxes, he wouldn't just say, I'm a technology entrepreneur. He would say something like, I'm a technology entrepreneur, recently started reading into the philosophy of science, but what I'm really excited about is playing the piano. And so what he's doing here is he's giving you three potential dots where you could be like, oh my God, such a coincidence. My sister is teaching on the philosophy of science. You should get in touch. Oh my God, such a coincidence. We're hosting piano matinees. You should drop by. The point is, I'm a big fan of doing a serendipity journal where you write down, what are some curiosities I have at the moment? Or what are some of the things I want to do? I want to expand my business to Poland. I want to um, you know, learn more about parenting, whatever that is. And then building that into conversations with our colleagues, with new people. And it's amazing how from the most unexpected of places, people will be like, oh my God, such a coincidence. My uncle actually just worked on X, Y, Z. Let me put you in touch. The point is we have to allow other people to connect the dots for us to make it more likely. There's a lot of these kind of practices, but at the end of the day, a lot of it, of course, comes back to how we engage with the world. And I mentioned earlier, you know, there's all these self-limiting beliefs, right? Self-limiting beliefs where we self-center. And maybe if you want to shout, those of you in the room who have some kind of imposter syndrome, shout here. Shall we try again? Who's more honest? Yeah? So I assume it's most of the room, right? And that's a good thing, right? It's usually kind of the sign of someone who wants to, who, who is self-aware enough to actually realize, hey, look, we're all somehow winging it sometimes, and that's fine, right? But we, we still might have that. And so the beautiful thing is what we see a lot in our work is we all have these kind of self-limiting beliefs, right? Being at imposter syndrome, um, you know, it might be fear of rejection, you name it, but then we can work on this. And so I'm a huge fan of really working on this first, on the Serendipity Journal, really thinking about something like, if serendipity could have happened, but it didn't in my life, right? That situation in the coffee shop where you felt this could be the love of my life, but you didn't act on it. Why was that the case? What held me back? And then really working on that underlying fear that might be there. Something I found extremely helpful, for example, is, you know, I was always afraid of this sting of rejection, right? So let's say you're at a conference and you unexpectedly bump into the speaker afterwards, but you don't want to bother them. You don't speak with them or you know, that love interest in the coffee shop because maybe there's this thing of rejection. I don't have time for you, I, I don't have X, Y, Z. And I always thought that would be the worst thing, right? that kind of sting of rejection. And then I realized that's not the worst thing. The worst thing is walking outside and thinking, ah, what could have happened had I spoken with that person, that feeling of regret. And so what I realized is once I reframe away from what's the worst thing that can happen if I do it to what's the worst thing that can happen if I don't do it, that actually makes it much easier to act on those potentially serendipitous moments and to make them then uh, truly meaningful 
in our lives. And so there's a lot of those kind of ways, but I think we obviously want to acknowledge that, uh, you know, there's a lot of objective constraints out there, right? So there's a lot of societal inequality. Our starting positions are very different. So I think the responsibility of everyone in the audience who is fortunate enough in a way to be here today is also to help other people to have those opportunity spaces where they can have more of this uh, serendipity being it via education, via social networks, and so on. And that really comes back to Goethe. Uh, Goethe, you know, I grew up in Heidelberg, uh, where Goethe wrote a lot of his poems. And he had this beautiful idea that if you take someone as they are, you make them worse. But if you take them as what they could be, you make them capable of becoming what they can be. It, once we start seeing a little bit more in a situation, in a person, we allow them to see the potentiality of the moment and hopefully then help them also to make that happen. And that's what serendipity is all about. Serendipity is about potentiality and then making that potentiality happen. And I think we can all do that for each other and for ourselves. With this, thank you so very much.